Uh, yes. Don't feel <laughs> obligated, no, anybody. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate you coming here and sharing your thoughts. Um, both you and, um, and Mayor Sheehan mentioned the challenge of being uh, cost competitive with the suburbs. Um, and I'm sure part of that is your taxes, part of that's your utility costs, part of that's your infrastructure costs. Um, how do your water and sewer rates compare to the suburbs? Do you know, are they competitive? Uh, yes, in, again, the city of Schenectady uh, for sewer, we provide sewer services for the city of Schenectady, for the village of Scotia, part of the town of Glenville, part of Niskayuna, and a chunk of southern Saratoga County, so it is a really a regional uh, facility. Uh, we have uh, similar agreements in terms of water with the town of Niskayuna, so that we price that uh, very competitively uh, with what we do for our own residents. And do you charge a, a premium for providing water and sewer service to the surrounding communities? Uh, we call it a, a fair rate. It covers our costs, uh, of, and yes, of course. and yes, we. Uh, make a little bit of uh, money on it, but uh, again, it is, would be cheaper than if they had to uh, build and maintain their own systems independently. On the flip side, it seems whenever you have a water and sewer infrastructure project, it also almost invariably involves a sidewalk and a road project. Exactly. Because everything's on the ground. And some of your, even your highway infrastructure is more extensive and expensive than your suburb because you have curbs, underground drainage, and all the utilities are in the ground. Um, is there a role for the state in helping address some of those cost differentials, in your opinion? Yes. Again, being here today, I would like to, out of this, have discussions evolve into a partnership so that there would be a funding stream that municipalities could access, whether, again, it becomes a loan program, which somewhat exists through EFC now, or outright grants to facilitate uh, just projects as you've outlined. The ideal reconstruction project is one where you've lined up the money where you're doing the subsurface water and sewer, uh, the utilities are doing gas lines or other uh, conduits that they may have in place. And then you're able to do the surface work where you're doing street surface curbs and sidewalks. Because then you're taking care of a uh, section of real estate and really positioning it, hopefully, for what will be 50 or maybe 100 years into the future. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Otis? There we go. Mr. Mayor, nice to see you. You. Uh, you had in your written testimony, you had some numbers in terms of some of the water infrastructure needs, uh, it, it, sort of general numbers. Do you have, um, and if you don't have them handy, it'd be good to share with the, the committee and the chair. Um, do you have like a multi year plan of uh, a game plan for how you're going to tackle um, the, the, uh, sanitary sewer overflow problem or any of the other? We're going through that process. And again, our uh, wastewater treatment plant dates back to uh, early 1900s. And I'll say that during Irene and Lee, significant high water events, that plant uh, operated in total compliance. We never deviated. It was able to handle really uh, an impressive amount of uh, discharge. But at the same time, we're looking to build in the resiliency, the uh, agreement that we've entered into in the consent order. We're still putting together some of those numbers, but it's uh, you know, $24 million. Some of the, uh, that kind of gives us the base package. The higher level could run into the low $30 million uh, price tag. And I don't have that money lined up, and we're still doing some of the design work for that and then would be able to uh, really firm up those numbers and uh, look at scenarios that uh, become the most cost effective. Great. I, I would recommend you look at the grant program because that would, would help pay um, a piece of that uh, and uh, it seems like you have valid projects that would do well and you're probably already dealing with EFC on other things. Anyway, uh, correct. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Otis. Ms. Fahey. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mayor. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, can I talk on what is uh, not necessarily a self-serving issue, but uh, streetlight replacement? You talked about the need to uh, use technology um, and the, the benefits of it, especially now when we can um, don't necessarily have to dig to get better access. Um, it was a bill that, uh, as you know, we, um, we pushed through last year, Senator Griffo and I, and I think you have a better command over it than, than others, and I know you've been looking at how to use streetlights uh, to increase a whole host of infrastructure needs, um, whether it's for police, for better access for your underserved neighborhoods. Uh, can you talk about any uh, preliminary thoughts or updates on that that you may have uh, for, with regard to infrastructure? Uh, sure, and I appreciate the leadership that uh, you showed in terms of moving that forward so that we're able to take old fixtures that are inefficient, look at moving them, converting them to LED fixtures, and some of that, again, the light pole uh, and the lighting becomes a small component of the technology that is out there today, where uh, lights, you go to an LED light, uh, it will save you money. It's much more efficient than uh, mercury vapor, the other uh, halide ones that are out. Uh, but within the LED fixture, you can have it set so it will be at a certain level for some time, so it may be 100% up until 11 o'clock at night. Then it would dim down after that, going to 50%. By putting motion sensors there, if a car or somebody walks down the street, that uh, light would brighten up. Uh, you could program lights so that they're only at uh, 85 or 90 percent all the time, but if somebody is crossing the street, they would go to 100 percent. So a car or vehicle coming to the uh, spot would see a brighter light and be aware of uh, pedestrian traffic. The vehicle analytics that are uh, available now allow, uh, we normally would do uh, sensors that would trip for one vehicle approaching an intersection. Uh, with the high-definition cameras that can be mounted on the light pole today, you can synchronize the traffic control device differently if you have 10 compact cars approaching the light as opposed if you have 10 big SUVs. Uh, you have the added feature of just having the security by virtue of a camera and you have the ability to either treat that uh, confidentially or proprietary for solely a police function, or you can open it up so it becomes more of a marketing tool for activities in downtown uh, areas of uh, interest, or you're putting up on a uh, webcam that's just available for general promotion of a community. Uh, and you're getting all that data for in the short term uh, and in real time. Now, on the other end of that spectrum, is if you have the high definition cameras take one picture a month of your street surface and you do that over a five year period or seven year period, that really becomes your pavement management program where today you have to send people out to uh, look at the street surface, evaluate it, put a numeric value on the condition of the street. That can all be done from the light post now. and that's. Really, as you look at uh, providing access and some of the uh, inequities that exist within uh, the educational, uh, or the delivery of educational services within our school districts, that where you don't have the access at uh, home for broadband, having the upgraded street lights and those communication devices where you have broadband or Wi Fi access within uh, neighborhoods where they might be low income or otherwise disadvantaged, you can create really an uh, environment that equalizes that and allows, uh, again, people to move at a different level than they might otherwise. Thank you, Mayor. I think so much of what you see with regard to how we can use technology to better monitor and um, better in improve our infrastructure is uh, 
you know, I think it is the wave of the future and in the end will be more economical as well. Um, and love your, love your street uh, repaving uh, idea as well. And the same with potholes, the same with some other issues. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fahey. Um, ideas before you go. Um, um, we were talking about the reservoir of funds that might be doled out to various communities around the state, you know, laying there. Where can we get it? Any ideas on that? Taxes, bond issues? Please, guide and I us. think you have to look at all those options, but the real underlying value of doing the infrastructure development, again, will allow communities like Schenectady and places across upstate New York and even continued development in New York City is to be able to reverse that image of a high-taxed, highly regulated state where people did not want to do business. And we are able to attract younger, smarter people back to our communities. We're able to attract businesses to our communities. And you're going to see growth uh, at the state level in terms of income tax revenue and other streams that are already in place and that existing. And it's how do you balance that so that we are able to attract people and then at the same time uh, have a tax structure or fee structure that is fair and equitable and does not put us at a disadvantage with respect to other options that people have where they may choose to locate a business or where they may want to reside. Thank you. Andy, you good? Um, you mentioned you have a $24 million consent order. The mayor of Albany has a $110 million consent order. In your view, was the consent order process reasonably fair and equitable? Do you believe the scope of the project and the timing of the project is fair and equitable? <coughs> and do you think the state should provide more funding to support those consent orders? What's your view of that process? I was uh, very pleased with the discussions with DEC. Uh, found them really to approach it uh, in a fair and open manner. Uh, we had some frank discussions, uh, very technical uh, engineering evaluations, uh, but it's the nature of the infrastructure that's in place in some of the evolving goals. It's not only state regulation, but some of the federal criteria that's being uh, put on wastewater systems that come down from the federal level, uh, which then the state is uh, required to enforce, they're very expensive. In, in an old industrial city, like the city of Schenectady, the rate payers in the short term, I can't go back to them and ask for, uh, again, the 24 million is really the base number. The ideal package would probably be $32 million. Uh, it's a significant investment on top of what we already do in terms of maintenance and uh, maintaining the system that's in place. So how are you going to fund it? I'm not quite sure. But uh, on a last comment, I, I was fascinated by your uh, discussion of the technology that you can put on an LED pole with the high uh, accuracy cameras. Uh, I was just thinking if that was publicly available, I would know when my in-laws are coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor, for your testimony. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, thank you very much, and thank you for putting up with that. Uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good day. And we're, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to use your testimony well, wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our list is the, um, the Honorable Mayor of the um, City of Troy, Patrick Madden. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, we eagerly let, await your, your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the uh, committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Patrick Madden. I'm the newly el elected mayor of the city of Troy, and today marks the beginning of my second month on the job. Um, I, I don't have the experience or depth of knowledge of Mayor Sheen or McCarthy on these matters. Uh, but I did not hear an issue that they raised that we don't share in Troy, and I did not hear them take a position uh, that we would feel differently on. 
while uh, much of this I am still working to get a grip on, uh, it didn't take me long to become intimately familiar with the aging infrastructure in our city. On Sunday, January 17th, just two weeks into my administration, a major water main in the north end of our city ruptured uh, in a catastrophic failure. Uh, the break opened a massive crater in the middle of the street. The force was so great that shattered shale and concrete were driven down uh, our streets for blocks by the force of the rushing water. In all, over 8 million gallons of processed water gushed from out of that rupture, uh, flooding basements and overwhelming sewer lines. City, state, and county emergency management services were called to the scene to assess the damage and lend assistance. The break occurred in a 110-year-old 33-inch main. That particular main, constructed of riveted steel, runs a total of 3,700 feet and carries roughly half of the water that flows through our system. It should be noted that Troy is the principal supplier of treated water to nine communities, uh, representing <coughs> approximately 135 customers in three separate counties in the capital region. Each day we process roughly 21 million gallons of uh, potable water and distribute this to our uh, customers in our surrounding communities. These towns and, and cities choose to receive water from Troy because of its high quality. The ramifications of this particular incident were quite significant. All communities served by our system were asked to conserve water. Two communities, the towns of Half Moon and Waterford, because of their location on our system, were more severely inconvenienced. In an effort to keep water flowing to their residences, residents, schools were closed and so were businesses, uh, some for up to uh, as many as six days. We were fortunate that no hospitals or senior living facilities needed to be evacuated. The water main break was more than a mere inconvenience. It impacted commerce and could have had serious health and safety concerns. And while final costs have yet to be calculated, there is no doubt that the cost of this event will negative, negatively impact other city services and operations. Approximately 145 miles of sewer, of, I'm sorry, of water lines run beneath the streets of the city of Troy with ages ranging from 1860 through the present day. The estimated cost to replace our recently damaged section of water main, just the section that ruptured two weeks ago, is close to $2.7 million. That represents 0.4% of our entire distribution system. Without investments in our infrastructure, the recent growth and economic gains we have seen in Troy and surrounding communities could be at risk. Reliability of infrastructure is a key determinant in a business's decision to locate or grow. A failure to invest further in our aging infrastructure poses a risk not only to our quality of life, but to our further economic prosperity. Without reliability in our systems, we will see further degradation of our upstate city's ability to retain key partners who bring investment and jobs to legacy cities like Troy. And it is important to note that Troy is not alone in facing issues of aging infrastructure. Cities across New York State are looking for avenues to address the very same concerns. This is a statewide problem, and it requires a comprehensive and coordinated approach from our municipalities and state leaders to take steps to ensure the future prosperity of small cities like Troy. Cities are doing all they can to control spending while maintaining essential services, but the fiscal path they are on is not sustainable. In response to the restrictive tax cap and declining state assistance, local governments are eliminating services, cutting jobs, deferring investment in our infrastructure, and dipping into our reserves. According to NICOM's analysis of the state controller's data between 2008 and 2014, total unassigned fund balances in cities decreased by 25 percent, this during a period of economic recovery. This forced fiscal austerity has had the unfortunate effect of deferring critical infrastructure by, by localities in order to fund and maintain essential municipal services. Yet we all understand that infrastructure is essential both to a community's economic growth and improved quality of life. New York may be the empire state, but it is not an empire. It is, it is an amalgamation of towns, villages, and cities. If New York State is to work, each of its component parts must be working. As our cities go, so goes New York State. The risks associated with deferred investment in our infrastructure are not isolated to local communities. They are a very real risk to the state's standing as a place to grow, to locate and grow businesses. They are a risk to our state's standing as a desirable place to raise families. 
Our cities need, our cities need critical investment in our networks of inf infrastructure, an investment we are not able to make on our own. Our state leaders le need to understand that they have an important and vital role in ensuring that our infrastructure does not hold back the potential of the residents and businesses of this great state. I appreciate the time you've given me today, and I look forward to providing additional input as the budget process continues. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if I was going to ask you, like I asked uh, uh, Mayor Sheehan, what your number one priority is in your infrastructure needs, you would probably answer water and sewer lines. Huh? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, 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 and I take it in the city of Troy, as it stands now, there is no ongoing replacement um, policy for replacing all the uh, the infrastructure needs in that in that area. We do prepare a capital plan each year, and we fund it as we are able. We're not able to fund it to the degree that we prudently should. Okay, and I'm not trying to be cute. Mm -hmm. Let's say tomorrow it, it, it all of a sudden becomes uh, Governor Patrick Madden. What would your solution be? Um, here in the state of New York to providing for not only the city of Troy, but the city of Amsterdam and, and all the cities around the state when it comes to these areas. What do you think the state should be doing? And I guess it's going to involve money. How would we raise that money in your eye? What's the best way to go about doing it? Well, you're correct. I would advocate a fund, a trust fund, or a set-aside fund dedicated for infrastructure needs. Um, in terms of the sources of funding, um, I, I think uh, I would agree with Mayor Sheen. We have uh, recovery money from the uh, settlements a few years ago that um, uh, would, uh, could desperately be used for infrastructure replacement. Um, bond funding might be another option as we do for housing in New York State. Good. Mr. Goodell, do you have anything? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, joining us, Governor. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, does your water and sewer division maintain any capital reserves to cover this type of uh, emergency situation? We do maintain uh, a, it's, we don't call it a capital reserve, but retained earnings, yes. We have a balance in retained earnings. It's not, uh, again, it's not, uh, in my view, uh, as far as I have learned to date, it's not sufficient for outgoing capital needs, though. Um, as you can appreciate, and it goes a little bit to uh, uh, Chairman Benedetto's question, one of the challenges that we have on the state level is if we make funds available, how do we allocate it in a fair and equitable manner? And one approach is to put it into a revolving loan fund because then it's repaid. But that only helps you with the interest component of in a capital investment. What, is there any other methodology that you would recommend that we consider implementing to allocate these funds amongst different communities? I'm assuming that the state doesn't have enough funds to fully fund everything up front. I, I think that's, I think I would agree with that statement. And again, based on what I've learned at this point, um, uh, I know EFC has a loan fund um, to uh, blend that based on need, based on a, on a pro forma uh, with grant dollars, I think would extend um, the ability of the state's dollars to serve more communities. Um, you know, some mayors start out their term with baptism by fire. You had baptism by water. I did. I did. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing your uh, perspective with us. Thank you. Mr. Otis. Uh, you touched on in your testimony an important challenge for municipalities on, that, uh, on uh, in this matter, which is uh, the diminishing undesignated fund balance or reserves that municipalities traditionally would use to pay for a part of a capital project. And uh, an added component of that is municipalities, if their undesignated fund balance goes down, they're more likely to have their bond rating uh, be downgraded, which then inversely raises the cost of borrow when you have to borrow. Correct. Uh, so just uh, as it relates to uh, your municipality and, and dealing with that sort of mix, any additional thoughts and uh, the, you touched on it a little, but the, you're in the news because of a water line break, but clearly Troy has an aging infrastructure for sewer and storm, storm water. Do you have like a, a, a macro long-term dollar cost for fixing that infrastructure? 
I, I know we've started doing that. Again, it's not, uh, uh, it's not my walk, in the, or walk around knowledge yet. I don't have all the numbers in my head, but I would guess it's similar to Schenectady's in terms of size. Um, and engineering continues to be done on, on various pieces of it, so the final dollar total is not known at this point in time. But yes, we do have that, and we will. Uh, there is, you know, as Mayor McCarthy suggested, you know, stay tuned. We will try to figure out how to do this as we move forward. But there's not a there's not a plan as to where these funds will come from at this point in time. Sure. I guess my recommendation to every municipality is: is that as you get an understanding of those kinds of numbers. They would be good to uh, share with the chair sure. um, because that would uh, put more, uh, give the legislature more detail on how we could try and, and address the need. When we, we could quantify it a little better. But thank you for uh, your testimony uh, today and last week, and, and, and good luck with that serious crisis. Thank you very much. Yes, and um, Good luck as well, you know, from me to you. And, and, and do please, one of the reasons for, you know, having these hearings that are going to be going over from now to the, you know, uh, next week is just to get a sense of uh, not just the needs, but the cost. And um, so we could look going ahead and budget accordingly and, and be able to help our city. So we wish you all the best. And uh, um, there's always the sun that's going to come out tomorrow. Yes. So, uh, thank you. At least it's not snowing. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Next on our list is the um, um, mayor of the city of Amsterdam, the Honorable Michael Villa. Chairman, thank you. I share the thoughts of uh, the Troy mayor. I as well uh, took office January 1st, and although I didn't get a baptism by water, I did get one by fire. <laughs> um, like a lot of small cities, we face enormous um, tasks ahead of us. Uh, in my uh, handout to you, I just pinpointed our water and sewer uh, deficiencies, um, but I would be remiss in saying that we don't have other issues. Uh, we have just foreclosed on 345 properties for a population of 18,500. So that will tell you the significant amount of blight that we face. Uh, we have a financial situation where we have a $30 million budget and we also have $30 million of debt. So being able to finance projects such as we're discussing today become very difficult for us. So uh, I'll just briefly touch on the high points of, of my handout, um, and I will be brief. Uh, and as I said, uh, similar to most of our urban neighbors, we have a deteriorating infrastructure. In our case, that deterioration, if not addressed, has a potential to paralyze our city and the surrounding towns and villages that rely on our systems to function. As I said, I began my term January 1, and one of my main areas of focus has been the current break-fix situation we face in terms of our infrastructure. For many years, if there was an issue with the sewer, water, or pump stations, certainly crews would address it, but little has been done over the last several years in terms of a proactive approach uh, to improve and update those systems. Funding and a lack of planning initiatives coupled with the decrease in AIM funding makes our aging systems one break away from a complete municipal disaster. When it was built, the accepted practice was to combine the storm, water, and sanitary wastewater into one conveyance system. However, the city is now under that same NY, New York State DEC order that many of uh, our neighbors are um, to remove the stormwater from the sanitary sewer system. So in the recent past, the city had invested several million dollars to comply with the new regulations. And as an application underway currently to obtain $5 million in an EFC loan and hopefully grant uh, to help fund uh, this 
project and defray that impact on our taxpayers. Without a significant investment into these failing systems, our ability to attract employers, private investors, and even the next generation of families will not exist. The sanitary sewer system that serves the entire city of Amsterdam, the village of Hageman, the village of Fort Johnson, and a portion of the town of Amsterdam, as well as a portion of the town of Florida, segments of this system date back to the early 1900s, the major portion of which was mapped in 1928, with the additional mapping in subsequent years to accommodate our neighboring villages and towns. There are over 330,000 feet of sewer piping that consists of a combination of clay, concrete, transite, and PVC pipe ranging in diameter from 6 inches to 48 inches. This inconsistent, moderately functioning system serves in excess of 25,000 residents currently. An engineering report has been prepared with the CWSRF, Clearwater State Revolving Fund, application that provides more details on the specific deficiencies and improvements that need to be completed. We are hopeful that we will attain substantial great grant funding under this initi initiative. More funds certainly will be needed to really achieve the DEC unfunded mandate. In addition, there are upgrades and improvements needed at our wastewater treatment plant. In the near future, that will be in excess of $2 million. Amsterdam is blessed with an abundance of water. We have three dams um, that could easily support uh, not only our county, but neighboring counties, such as Fulton and, and Saratoga County, with the necessary improvements. The three water reservoirs located in the Adirondacks were built in the late 1800s and have served our city very well. But upgrades are needed to restore available storage capacity. The dams that hold the water are in need of repairs, as required by New York State DEC regulations, and they include the following. Raw water transmission line. The 13 mile long, 24 inch transmission line con conveys the untreated wa raw water to the city's water filtration plant. The 100-year-old transmission line has stood the test of time but will eventually need to be replaced. The cast iron pipe has many leaking joints and the line is inaccessible. When we have a break, it is very critical that repairs are made as quickly as possible. As the system continues to age, we are experiencing more frequent emergencies and costly repairs. The area around the main transmission line from the city's reservoirs to the water treatment plant needs to be cleared to improve access in case repairs to the line are needed. The location of that line is currently overgrown, not easily seen. The cost to clear the land, provide better access, especially at the more difficult locations, is estimated at $1.2 million. Our city's water main distribution system, after water is treated at the water treatment facility, water is conveyed through a network of over 86 miles of water mains ranging in size from four inches to 24 inches in diameter. Many of the mains are too small or have become clogged to the point that adequate flow is a serious concern when fighting a fire. This actually happened during a fire on the north side of the city three years ago. Water mains need to be upsized and replaced in many of the older areas of the city. Fire hydrants, line valves, and pressure reducing valves need to be replaced as well and are needed to ensure consistent high quality water service. These upgrades will create efficiency, consistent high quality, improve fire flow capability for our municipality and surrounding towns that depend on our water. The required upgrades are approximately $9 million. And so you see the, the items that we face are very similar to what you've heard prior to, to my um, testimony here today. Uh, just that Amsterdam has a shrinking tax base, financial issues that we're trying to tackle. Um, we have so many issues that we just, there's no way that we can fund these types of projects on the backs of a shrinking tax base. Um, so it's a difficult task that lies ahead of us. 
uh, one that's going to require the assistance of the state, federal, uh, grants, and uh, we do all we can. We seek out every grant that is available. We're fortunate to have an excellent grant writer. Um, but again, you can see uh, the um, obstacles that we face. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to our concerns and hopefully your help. 